judgment they thought they sealed his fate but holy destiny was calling him to that hill far away Pilate said behold the man I find no fault in him if they could have just understood he was guilty of loving them. There was no fault found in him. There was no evil found. Yet God's precious holy lamb was nailed to a tree. If tender mercy was his only crime, so that grace could be yours and mine, then Jesus was guilty of loving me. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to Yet they shouted, Crucify! Pilate said, One shall go free. So which man will it be? They cried, Jesus, he has to die. He was guilty of loving me. There was a fall.
Thank you very much. Hey. Praise the Lord. I'm glad the Lord looks at me, he doesn't see me, amen. amen. Appreciate that good singing, good song. Well, Brother James, it's been a blessing to have Brother James with us again this year. And uh, you pray for it. <laughs> Brother, it's been a blessing for me to be here. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with this other crowd that's babies, you said this morning. Been a lot of murmuring hey. in the wilderness. <laughs> amen. amen. For Stay you, up here. Okay. Let's have a piano player. Piano player, yeah. All the pastors, bring a songbook. Come on up here. Let's sing a song. Amen. Be a pastor. Come on up tonight and bring a songbook with you. Amen. We'll sing 711. 711. Watch the fourth verse. It's uh, not what you're used to, but it's pretty good. Amen. Amen. Seven I just finished my part. What's that? I just finished my part. You just thought you were about it. You just thought you were about it. Amen. Amen. All right. See everybody. See everybody. See everybody. It's me. 
tell you something about this song we just sang. If you've seen Brother Tyrone walk up here right before we started the second part of the service, he said, Preacher, before we leave tonight, can we sing Sweet Hour Prayer? You know what I told him? I said, I've already written down in my Bible right here. I want to sing, what does that say? Sweet Hour Prayer. Sweet Hour Prayer. Amen. All right, let's be dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise and, and when that happens we'll bid farewell sweet hour of prayer there'll be, there'll be nothing left to pray about praise God until then there's a lot to pray about there really is I want to talk to you this evening. I, I, I've preached two sermons this week, and you can't take any more of that. Somebody said, somebody said Santa must have been mean to you. Listen, this year, everybody messed up. Price of, price of everything, you should have hoped for coal. <laughs> Lord, no toys, coal. Bring, bring me coal this year. Anyway, I want to talk to you uh, for a little while this evening about God's prayer life. Might be interesting. God's prayer life. And he has one. And I'm glad he does. I'm really glad he does. Because when he tells me about my prayer life, he tells me why I'm dependent upon his prayer life. Because mine's not very good. Just start there. Heavenly Father, help us tonight from your word. We've had a great time together this week. It's a, it just I just love coming to this place and so enjoy the people here, so enjoy what, what seems to be a remnant of how things used to be. And I thank you for that, Father. And you've spoken to our hearts in, in the sermons and in the singing, and we've, we've been able to encourage one another. And I pray you'd help me tonight preach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. One, one quick follow-up, Brother Andrew's message, uh, because we, we unburden our hearts to each other and we get together. And, and we talk about things that we we're, are, are weighing all of us down. And you know, a lot of those, none of those church troubles are God's will. They're not. And none of this discord is God's will. But I'll tell you what every bit of it does is it causes us to lose our self-confidence. And that's a good thing. It, it's, I don't welcome any trouble in our church. But I tell you what it does, it shakes you out of that, I got this all figured out, it's on cruise control. Amen. And so for that, we, we thank, thank the Lord, or we should. Amen. I'm not there yet, but, but I, <laughs> Paul said I glory in infirmities. How? <laughs> anyway, that's not the topic. Okay, so uh, Romans chapter number 8, let's start here, Romans chapter 8. And I, I'm just going to read some, some highlights here to get to the place I need to be. Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation them which are in Christ Jesus. Thank God. Amen. Uh, verse number 2, uh, free. Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. Thank God. Uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 9, uh, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If Christ be in you, uh, so, so I have Christ. I have the Holy Spirit. I have salvation. I, I'm not condemned. Praise the Lord. Verse number uh, 16, the Spirit itself bareth witness to our spirit. We are the children of God. If children then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm not condemned. I'm saved. I'm justified. I have Jesus Christ. I have the Holy Spirit. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I must spend eternity with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Same person, 17. If so be, we suffer with him. Verse 18, the sufferings of this present time. Verse uh, 20, um, subject to vanity, not willingly. Verse uh, 21, the bondage of corruption. Verse 22, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. We are saved by hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. What a man seeth, 
Why do you hope for? But if we hope for that, we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it? So tonight, tonight, I'm in a room full of people washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I'm in a room full of people saved and sealed by the Holy Ghost of God. I'm in a room full of people who have eternal life, who are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And every one of you has a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a loved one whose body is broken, whose mind is broken, whose home is torn apart. Every one of you comes from a church that has people in it that are on fire for Jesus Christ and in love with the Lord and other people who wouldn't care if it burned to the ground. And these two things exist side by side. And you love Jesus and your back is killing you. Right? And you read your Bible and you pray every day. And, and your thoughts are slipping away from you faster than, than you wish they would. And, and you, you, have, you have prayer meetings and you evangelize and you study and teach the Bible. And new people come to your church and say, I love this. I've never found a place like this. It's wonderful. And they wave goodbye to somebody who's leaving at the same time. And I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says to those of us he describes in Romans 8 as rejoicing and groaning and full of joy and full of travail and, and full of excitement and full of fear. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Just like he saved you, just like he justified you. Just like he, he gave you in your heart this liberty to say, Abba, Father. That same Holy Spirit likewise helpeth our infirmities. Now, here's why I've got to get a hold of this, and you've got to get a hold of this. And if you're 25, just keep jumping off stuff and running into stuff and crashing things and pretending it's never going to hurt. Just enjoy it. Go for it. Yeah. This is an amazing thing. I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and that does not deliver me from infirmity. God loves me enough to shed his blood to pay for all my sins and is gracious enough to justify me without works, purely by his grace. Amen. Thank the Lord. But it doesn't deliver me from the effects that that sin has upon my body, the effects your sin has on your body, and the effects that each of our sins have upon one another. If you live 80 years in this world, get saved when you're 8. If you don't get saved when you're 28. If you don't get saved when you're 58. But you're going to spend 80 years with everybody's sins crashing into you. And all your sins crashing into everybody else. You know the Bible says Jesus, Isaiah 50. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows in addition to paying for our sins. You know, there's a lot of sins that are paid for, but they still hurt. Yes, sir. That's right. And there's a lot of things that are forgiven, but they still cause grief. Right. Right. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? I can, I, best I can do right now is help you with that. Right. One day, we're going to bid farewell to the sweet hour of prayer. And we're going to go to a place where there's no sickness, no sorrow, no pain, no death. But we're going to have to go there because it's not here. Right. And it's not coming here. So watch this. Spirit itself helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You know what the Lord just told you? I want you to pray. I want you to pray without ceasing. I want you to bring me every burden and every care. But just understand. I can't answer all your prayers because you don't even know what you're talking about. And I want to hear you. I want to fellowship with you. I want you to pour your heart out to me. But do not demand that I give you what you're asking for. Because I can't. My, my mother fell in January. My mother had surgery at the end of January. The, uh, the doctors came in and told her, uh, she's 96 years old, sound mind, 
reading without glasses, uh, just, just at, at church every service, and the doctor told my mother, you will not be able to live in your home any longer. You will not walk again, but you may live for several years. And she said to the doctor, I was, I was there, she said, the doctor said, let me think that over. The next morning, I've got a sister at saved. Next morning, my mother said to me, said to my sister, said, I'm going to miss you. But if it's all right with you, I'm going to go be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And she spent that day giving instructions to me, to my son, to my sister, to my brother. And went to sleep that night. And four o'clock the next afternoon in her sleep, she went, I'm almost there. And two hours later, she was with Jesus. She just talked it over the Lord and said, I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to go. I'm not, I'm not going to lay in a bed for four or five years and make people wait. That's just, just how it went with her. Now, now listen. You can pray all you want for your grandmother or your mother or your husband or your wife. Everybody's going to die. And if you come to me and say, Pastor, my mother's sick. She's in the hospital. Would you pray for God to heal her? I will do that for you. But if she's 99 and has half of one lung, she's going to be with Jesus. I know that's an extreme example. But here's what I want you to understand. God wants us to pray about what's on our heart. He wants us to come to him as a father and pour out everything. But he can't answer all our prayers because they're not right. They're, they're, I'm going to say they're not sinful. I didn't say they're sinful. There are desires. But our desires aren't realistic. Our desire is that there's no wages of sin. Our desire is that there's no consequence for misconduct. Our desire is that God bring heaven down to earth so we don't have to cry anymore. You know what he said? I'll, I will pray for you. But I'm going to amend your request. And I, I'm going to, well, let me keep reading here. Likewise, the Spirit also helped with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But, but, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. Ah, watch this. According to the will of God. Amen. Now this is really great. I'm not telling you to stop praying. Just like Brother Andrew's not telling you to stop working for God until you're 100% of the control of the Holy Spirit. But I'm saying that. Here's what I'm telling you. Spend that sweet hour of prayer. But know this. God Almighty has placed between Him and you his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, right. so here I am praying, and here's Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. But there's another level of intercession. Right. The Holy Spirit inside me, while I'm praying, is speaking with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And the Holy Spirit says, disregard that last remark. <laughs> <laughs> he meant it, but if he only knew where that would lead. It would be a disaster. And so, so here's what I read in Romans chapter 8. I pray. Don't stop praying. Right. Right. Amen. And when I pray, I pour out my heart to God. Yes, sir. And the Holy Spirit inside me wants what's best for me. Right. And I don't know what that is. Right. He wants God's perfect will for my life. And I don't. I've got an agenda. And so the Holy Spirit takes my prayers and he and the Lord Jesus Christ work them out so that when they are presented to God the Father, they can be answered. And then God, knock and it, and it should be open of you, asking you shall receive. He didn't say asking you will receive what you asked for. He said asking you shall receive. 
So you pray, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, and God says, I will, but not that. <laughs> Faith is not believing that God is going to give you everything you name and claim. Faith is believing that God loves you enough and cares enough for you to give you what is best. Amen. I, I'm trying my best when I'm on the road. To, uh, I, I, the diabetes runs in my family. I don't want diabetes, but I want everything that causes diabetes. <laughs> And when I'm on the road, churches serve you carbs. I'm not complaining, because they're yummy. And they're cheap. Well, comparatively speaking. They, anyway, so Brother Jed, he's a nice guy. He's a blessing. I'm in the room today. I'm working at the computer. And he says, I'm at cookout. Can I bring you a milkshake? <laughs> Those things are great, man. Oh, yeah. They are great. They are like, I don't know if any of you do your blood, you know, but, but you can go from, from 600 to 800 on your blood count in just one cup. And they are, man, they are good. And you know what? I wanted one. And if he brought me one, I'd want one after church tonight. And if I couldn't decide which flavor, I would want two of them. <laughs> and I could probably eat two and then see things all night. In the, in the, uh. And you know what your children want? Ice cream. And you don't give them ice cream. And they cry. And you know what they think? You don't love them. If you love me, you'd give me ice cream. You wouldn't give me squash, squash. That's what you do to a bug. That's not a food. Brussels sprouts. Who's, who's the first guy that looked at that and said, let's eat that? Now, some of you probably lo like all that. Here, here's what I'm telling you. It would be, it would be delightful have a four-course meal, M&M's, ice cream, <laughs> chocolate, and then run a marathon. And you know something? A wise parent, unlike a cuckoo grandparent, is not going to let you eat that way. We cry, Abba, Father. Isn't that a blessing? We get to come into his presence and just ask all the questions Amen. that Brother Andrew was talking about. And we get to come to his presence and just pour out our heart without any fear he's going to laugh at us or make fun of us or insult us or call us names. But he's not going to allow us to dictate the terms by which he governs our life. Because we're not smart enough to pray intelligently. And so the Holy Spirit brings our prayers to the Holy Son who brings our prayers to the Holy Father. And if what we're not asking for doesn't contribute to holiness, you're going to have to eat your vegetables. That's a blessing. There's nothing wrong with asking God to help you win every person in your town to Jesus Christ. That's a great prayer. That's a noble prayer. But don't get mad at God if everybody didn't get saved. Is that, is that fair? All right, come to Hebrews chapter 7. I'm going to try, try to go quickly here tonight. Every preacher says that. They teach you that in, in seminary. Just, just keep saying over and over again, I'm going to go quickly. Jesus said, I come quickly. He, he didn't say, I come soon. <laughs> he just said, I come quickly. <laughs> How about that Philippians? Philippians got four chapters. Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, finally, my brethren. <laughs> he ain't nowhere close to finally. <laughs> All right, Hebrews chapter 7. Take a look at this, verse 23. 
they truly were many priests, Old Testament, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. You think about that. Everybody in, in, in Israel had the same priest, high priest. And if you had a good high priest, that was a blessing. Amen. Fifteen years later, he's dead. Yeah. Now you got a rotten high priest. He might live your whole generation. Then he dies, you get a mediocre high priest. So they just think, but this man, ha <laughs> ha, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Amen. Think about this. The great high priest to whom you pray is the same high priest to whom Paul prayed. There has not been a change in the high priesthood since Jesus Christ ascended to the Father's right hand. Every Christian who has ever lived has had the same high priest and he's been absolutely perfect. That's amazing. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, I don't want to open this, this can of worms that I don't have time to put them all on a hook, but I'm just going to tell you something. Romans 8 is written to save people, telling them you're not as saved as you're going to be because your body's not redeemed. And Hebrews 7 is written to save people, and he says, you're not saved to the uttermost because you're going to be a whole lot better when I'm through with you than you are right now. Isn't that? All my sins are forgiven. Right now, every one of my sins is paid for by Jesus Christ. His blood has paid for every sin I will ever commit. That's a fact. But when you see me after the rapture, I will be far more righteous than I am right now. I'll be far more Christ-like than I am right now, and so will you. So I'm saved, but I'm not as saved as I'm going to be. And I'm saved, but I'm not saved to the uttermost. Well, guess what's happening in the meantime? The one who saved me is interceding for me. And listen... The Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. I want you to think about something. Jesus Christ has not spent one minute paying for anyone's sins in the last 2,000 years. He finished that on the cross. He hasn't, he hasn't engaged in an act of creation in 6,000 years. He finished that in Genesis. He is not ruling over anything on earth right now. He's going to do that when he comes back. Amen. I say this reverently. The only thing Jesus did today was pray for saved people. That's, that's what he lives to do. If there are clocks in heaven, 24 hours a day, Jesus Christ is interceding for saved people. He'll come back and rule the earth. He created the earth way back then. He died for sins a long time ago. Today, what he's doing is praying for you. That's pretty amazing. Now, when you stop what you're doing and pray, you pray with him. But when you stop praying, he doesn't stop praying for you. That's pretty amazing. Some, I'm going to speak for every pastor here, and maybe I shouldn't say what I'm about to say because they wouldn't want me to say it, but it's true. If you ask me in the, in the lobby before church to pray for you about something, I'm going to do it right then. Because 12 more people are going to ask me to pray about something, and then we're going to have a church service, and then I'm going to go home, and something's going to be broke. And, and I'm not going to ever pray for you again if I don't do it right then. And it's not that I don't care. I just can't. I can't care as much as I want to. I can't be to you what you want me to be. Because you're just one of me, and he's not much. And there's a lot of you, and it's coming from every direction. And you ask the church, would you put me on the church prayer list? We will. 
But half the church don't even look at the list. They don't even open the email. I'm not trying to be mean. You know why? They're at work. They're sick. Their kids driving them crazy. They don't, have a, they don't have a minute left to pray for you. But Jesus, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, God Almighty manifest in a body of flesh. He said, I got time. I got, I got nothing else to do. I'm just waiting for the Father to say, go down there and straighten everything out. <laughs> Meantime, I just, I just pray. It's what I do. Uh, when I was a boy, just about everybody went to church. And the church I went to, people prayed one at a time. And a friend of mine, about third grade, fourth grade, invited me to go to church with him. He went to Assembly of God Church where everybody prayed at once. And not all of them in English. Well, Andrew said, boy, it'd be something I spoke in tongues up here. I'd like to see Andrew Ray speak in tongues. That'd, that would be, that'd be something to see. But anyway, I went to that church, and the preacher said, all right, it's time for prayer. And everybody started praying all at once. It just blew my mind, man. I, I, eyes wide open, looking around, and thinking, how does this work? <laughs> and on the way home, I asked his mom. I said, uh, uh, how, you know, how, you all pray all at the same time like that? And she said, God's smarter than you. <laughs> I couldn't sort out a room full of people praying at one time, but if everybody on the face of the earth was talking at the same time, God would hear every idle word. Amen. He's big enough. Amen. What do you think about something? You, uh, to me, they said, well, science, you know, we believe the Bible, not science. I think science ought to help people believe the Bible. Amen. You go home tonight, you sit down in front of that, that computer you got, and you type in uh, butterfly and hit a button. And it'll say, Google found 72,243,024 references to butterflies in .0003 seconds. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If Al Gore can invent something like that, <laughs> what can God do? <laughs> you don't think God could give everybody an answer to their prayers in less than a second? He could, and that's what he's doing. Now, now watch, I've I got I to gotta move on here. We've got to get out of here before the drunks hit the road Friday night. Think about where you used to be on a Friday night. And that's not, that ought to cause you praise God right there. You're here, not there. Anyway, uh, verse 26. For such an high priest became us. We needed a high priest like Jesus, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Now listen, if God says, I'll tell you what you need. You need a high priest that's holy. That tells me because I'm not. I'm not bragging about that. You need a high priest who is harmless. I wish I could say I'd never hurt anybody since I got saved. I wish I could say nobody's ever hurt me since they got saved. You know what we do? We hurt each other. Not Jesus. Amen. He's harmless. Undefiled. Undefiled. I'm driving up here. I'm driving up the highway to preach. And there's billboards defiling my eyes. There's things on the back of people's vehicles defiling my minds. I stop to get gasoline. And I, I, without wanting to, I behold something stronger than the steel beams that hold up giant bridges. Yoga pants. <laughs> how, can that, how can that little bit of fabric hold 350 pounds? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Two, two kind of people shouldn't wear yoga pants. People look good in them and people who don't. Listen, I'm not talking about committing sin. I'm talking about the world just dumping dirt in your eyes. 
dumping dirt in your ears. Just defilement from going to a grocery store or a restaurant. Not Jesus. Undefiled. Separate from sinners. He didn't spend 33 years hiding in a cave. He worked a construction job and was separate from sinners. He went to weddings where they were serving booze and remained separate from sinners. We're not talking about isolation. We're talking about non-participation. That's Jesus. Made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Now some of you thought you got, I derailed you when I said Jesus isn't paying for anybody's sins right now. He did that one time. One time. He doesn't go to the cross every time you sin. We don't do the mass. He doesn't go to the cross. Every time somebody wants to get saved, Jesus doesn't go die again. He's already their Savior. They just have to receive him. He's already paid for their sins. So what does that mean? That means he's not spending his days paying for your sins incrementally. Having paid for your sins, he's spending his days interceding on your behalf so that you will be given victory over the sins that sent him to the cross. Please do not, do not send me every prayer request you have. If it says urgent, I'll know it's physical. <laughs> I never get urgent prayer requests. I keep losing my temper. Urgent prayer request is something's broken, something needs to be operated on. So don't, but here's what I'm telling you. Jesus Christ is not as concerned with our physical well-being as he is with our spiritual condition. And he's not as concerned with making us healthy as he is making us Christ-like. Okay, so I got one more passage and I'm, I'm trying to get there. So at the right hand of the Father is someone who is holy. And on their knees in the prayer cloud is someone who is not holy. And what the Spirit of God and the Son of God want to talk to the Father about is not my sore elbow. It's my lack of holiness. And it's okay for me to pray about but, but the, the next door neighbor who won't stop bothering me. And it's okay for me to pray about my child who's making bad grades. It's okay to pray about all that. What the Holy Spirit is going to do with that prayer is talk to the son and say, how can we work so this gets some of the defilement out of his life? And we're saying, God, I need a raise. God, I need more money. And the Holy Spirit's saying, what, he, what he's actually saying is, he's not a good witness on his job, and he needs to get over his fear and his shame of the gospel. <laughs> See, Jesus is holy, and he wants us holy. And he's harmless, and he wants me harmless. And he's undefiled, and he wants me undefiled. And he's separate from sinners, and he wants me separate from sinners. And that's what he's praying about. And he wants us to, to as much as possible, get in this Bible and line up our prayers with his prayers. So he can answer our prayers instead of surprising us with something we never asked for. We we're talking breakfast this morning because that's how preachers fellowship. Food opens our hearts and our <laughs> mouths and our minds. Were you to read the prayers of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament? He's asking for spiritual enlightenment. He's asking for courage. He's asking that he won't chicken out when it's time to witness. He's asking that people be enlightened and see how great Jesus Christ is. One time, one time, he prayed, he prayed a selfish prayer for physical healing, and it's the only prayer he ever prayed God refused to answer. Now, should Paul not have prayed about a devil buffeting him? Oh, I think he should. Should he not have told the Lord, I'm really hurting here, could you heal my body? I think he should. 
But when the answer came, Paul said, the Holy Spirit and the Son took my prayer to the Father, and the answer came back, I'd rather have you glorying in me than thanking me for healing you. Pretty interesting, isn't it? All right, one more. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We've got to back up and get some context here and make a run at, at these verses. The children of Israel have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. They've been brought out of bondage in Egypt, praise the Lord. And waiting for them just a few months' journey, max, is a land flowing of milk and honey. And only two of them ever got there. They all could have gone there, but only two of them ever got there. One of, one of our men pre preached on that uh, this week, the spies and, and the rest of that. So verse number 1, chapter 4, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. That can't be earning salvation. Salvation by grace through faith. But what about people who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and delivered from the bondage of sin, who God's afraid they're not going to go on and get in the promised land? So they get in Canaan land, isn't that a type of heaven? Really? You think you're going to go to heaven and fight giants and Canaanites? The promised land is here. Amen. It's life in the wilderness or life in the promised land. Which one do you want? And the, the book, writer of Hebrews said, I'm afraid you're going to want the wilderness. For unto us was gospel preached, well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So these are people who put faith in the gospel when they heard it. You see that? All right. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall uh, enter into my wrath, although the works were finished now days of the world, for he spake a certain place in this wise, seven days of this wise, God rests the seventh day, in this place again, they shall enter into my rest, seeing then, now look, seeing then, therefore, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it's first preached and are not in because of unbelief, again, he limited a certain day, saying in David today after so long a time, as it is said today, if you hear my voice, harden not your hearts. For Jesus given them rest, then would he not after it have spoken another day? There remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. They're God's people. But there's a rest that's available to them that they haven't yet entered into. For he that enters rest, uh, he also had ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, let us labor, therefore, to enter that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What's the example of their unbelief? Not that they didn't get redeemed, but they didn't get the full benefit of their redemption. Come on, you see that? The example is, Israel's in bondage, they hear the way of deliverance, they apply the blood of the Lamb, they get delivered. Egyptians try to catch them and bring them back. God wipes out the Egyptians. You're free. Promised land, wilderness. Eh, we'll stay in the wilderness. Now the Lord said, that's the example. Are you saved? Amen. Victorious Christian life? Or muddling along like Christ never saved you even though you're saved? Now watch. Look at these verses in their context. Verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is any creature not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. People say, bless God, you take this Bible out there and you preach those lost sinners, you witness those sinners, it'll pierce them right to the heart. Probably not. It could, but you're out of context. Come on, what's the context? You are saved by the blood of the Lamb, and there's a rest waiting for you, and when you read God's Word, what's it going to do? It's going to show you what's keeping you in the wilderness. Yes, Amen. It's going to show you what needs to be cut away from your life so you can get to the promised land. Amen. That's the context of those verses. Now watch. Seeing then that we have a great high priest 
that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. If we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our, Romans 8, infirmities, Amen. but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Can I show you something? Let, let, let me try to put three passages together. Let me show you something. I'm saved. Anybody here saved? Okay. I'm saved, but beset with infirmity. I'm saved, but I'm not yet holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher in the heavens. I'm not. So when I read my Bible, it's not supposed to be about Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, JWs, and other church members who aren't as good as I am. It's supposed to pierce my heart Amen. and show me in my soul what is keeping me from being everything that Christ wants to make me. Amen. And when the Bible shows me something in my life that isn't what God wants, I'm supposed to run to my high priest right. and say, Lord, you were tempted with this and you didn't sin. Show me how. Yeah. Amen. Lord, you faced this victoriously. Show me how. Amen. Lord, you had the power to overcome this. Show me how. Come on. The Holy Spirit would much rather pray with you about that than your earache. Amen. And I'm not telling you not to pray about your earache. Amen. But our church prayer list, great people, lovely people, wonderful people, faithful people. The prayer list for health and healing are this long. There's nothing on there about laziness. There's nothing on there about discouragement. There's nothing on there about fear. There's nothing on there about, about griping and complaining. Where are the things the Holy Spirit wants to pray about? He has a prayer life. You know what we want? We want God to participate in our prayer life. He wants us to participate in his prayer life. Amen. Now, one more verse. One more verse. I'm going to show you the difference between victory and defeat. Verse 16 without the rest of the chapter. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know how I've heard that verse preached and taught my entire Christian life? The Lord loves you and he knows you're going to fall. And when you fall, I want you to come to the throne of grace and get help. But you can't. The Lord knows you're going to make a mess out of things. And when you've made a mess, I want you to come to the throne of grace and God will have mercy. Well, he might, he might not. You know what the context is? Come before you sin and let him help you to not sin. Amen. Come before you harm someone and let him show you how to not be harmful. Amen. Why do we wait until we have fallen to go to the throne of grace Amen. and ask God to pick us up? Why don't we find out in the Bible where we're subject to fall and go to the throne of grace and have God keep us upright so we don't fall? Amen. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to bring up anybody's past. But I'm going to, these, are, these are easy. It's, it's low-hanging fruit. I'm going to pick it. Some of you came from homes where alcohol was just as normal as sweet tea. And the Lord can save you from ever being a drunk. Amen. If you become a drunk, the Lord can save you from your drunkenness. Now you're saved. You're saved. Praise God. You're born again by the Holy Spirit. And you have a 40-year appetite for alcohol. And you have a deep-seated memory of the buzz, the high. It's there. Now, if you go out and you, you fall away and you drink and you get drunk and you run your car into somebody and you kill somebody's wife, 
You can come to the throne of grace and Jesus Christ, if you're sincere, will have mercy upon you. Amen. But somebody's dead and you're going to prison. Wouldn't it be better to go to the throne of grace when you first thought about drinking another beer? Why can't we learn to pray before we sin so we don't sin? Instead of this defeatist approach to life where we just come to God and pray when we've messed up and ask him to erase the consequences. Young lady, you fall out of church and get out there and find yourself with child, the Lord will forgive you. You repent, come back to Jesus, he'll forgive you. you got a baby to raise. Wouldn't it be better to come to God and say, God, I'm falling in love with a boy who wants to put his hands all over me and this isn't good. Lord, I'm falling in love with a boy who wants to park his pickup truck out in the dark. Help me, help me, help me. We, we have this mindset that the best I can do is make a mess because of the infirmity of my flesh and then come to the Lord for forgiveness. I'm telling you, there's a better way. Amen. The Word of God is swift and powerful and sharpened into a two-edged sword. When you read it, and you've got to read four chapters a day, but the second verse you read puts its finger on something in your life that isn't right, don't read the rest of your four chapters. Get to the throne of grace and get some help. Amen. Holy Spirit, Holy Bible, Holy Father, why are we settling for unholy lives? Amen. The Holy Spirit has a prayer life. He's an intercessor. Jesus Christ has a prayer life. He's an intercessor. We have a prayer life. Are we intercessors? Are we bringing our wish list to Santa Claus? You know what the Holy Spirit's praying about? He's praying that he can finish the work in me that was begun when I got saved of making me like Christ. Everything else is very, very secondary with God. You have a prayer life? Here's what I'd challenge you to do. Take your prayer list and set it aside. And make a new prayer list about what the Bible says needs fixing in your life. That's the one God wants to answer. Listen, he wants to hear both of them but he wants to answer this one. I want to be well every day. I want to feel good every day. I want to have enough money to never worry about my bills. I want to pastor a church where everybody loves each other so much <laughs> that they don't need me for anything but preaching sermons. You pray about that all you want. It ain't happening. <laughs> Why? You're praying contrary to what's written in Scripture. You know what is in the Bible? He which hath begun a good work in you will perform to the day of Jesus Christ. And Romans 8, 28 says, All things work together for good. Them love God. Them are called according to His purpose. And everybody stops there. You know what His purpose is? To conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. May I encourage you tonight, the Holy Spirit of God prays for you. The resurrected Son of God prays for you. You know what would revolutionize our prayer life? If we started praying their prayer list, not our prayer list. Take everything to the Lord. I'm not telling you, I pray about every, everything. Anything that comes in your mind, anything that comes in your heart, take it to God in prayer. Yes, but what he really wants to hear about is the things that the swift and powerful word of God pierced your heart with so he can make them what God wants them to be. Amen. Heavenly Father, 
I pray that I have not misrepresented you tonight. I pray that I've made understandable to your people some small part of your desire for their life tonight. God, we've heard so many things this week. We've, we've, we, our, our hearts and our minds are just swimming in, in information. But I pray, Lord, if we, if we could leave here tonight understanding that you didn't answer some of our prayers because we just didn't know what was best asked for. And if we could leave here tonight knowing that even on those days when we forget to pray, you never forget to pray for us, for our loved ones, for our church. Thank you, Father, for the Bible, for its truth, for what we've seen this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor.